I'm Paula Simmons and I've come here today um, for my meeting with Professor Sharma at St George's Hospital to discuss my Brigada syndrome. Um, it's just an um, update meeting and to check everything's going okay. Hi Paula. Hi. Nice to see you again. I just want to recap from where we left off last time. The reason that we became aware of you is that uh, your brother Craig died suddenly in Australia. Yeah, he did. And uh, I gather that uh, an autopsy performed at the time didn't really show any abnormality of the heart. Yeah, that's uh, right. Raising the possibility that he may have died from an electrical fault of the heart. And because many of these conditions are genetic, we felt it was prudent that all his first degree relatives were tested. And I believe I saw your parents and your siblings and we underwent uh, well, all of you, shall I say, underwent a comprehensive set of investigations which led to the diagnosis of Brugada syndrome. Yeah, that's right. Originally, um, Australia asked us to get in touch with our GPs, and um, so we did that, and they did a normal um, ECG test, and they said we were fine. Um, but we went and had Craig's autopsy read by Michael Burgess, um, yes. so he could explain it in more detail to us, at which point he put us in contact with Cardiac Risk and the Young, Mm -hmm. And then they um, asked us to go back to our GPs and then we got referred to you, had the test done and we got diagnosed with Brigada syndrome. I'm still a bit unsure about Brigada syndrome. I know there's lots of drugs that you need to avoid. So I just wondered if there's any, anything else you'll be able to tell me about Brigada syndrome. Yes, uh, Brigada syndrome is a, her a hereditary condition and it's inherited as an autosomal dominant trait. But that means that if one parent has it, then there's a 50% chance that that parent will pass the abnormal gene on to one of their offspring. So there's a 50% right. chance that you would have it if one of your parents had it. Um, it's a condition that affects the sodium ion channels within the heart. Now, within each heart muscle cell, there are tiny holes known as ion channels. And for electricity to pass through the heart, uh, certain chemicals have to go through these ion channels, including um, a salt called sodium. Now, people with Brugada syndrome have defective sodium ion channels so that the sodium ion channel current isn't normal, and that means that the electricity of the heart is unstable. Now, for reasons that are not clear, some people with this condition may die suddenly during situations when the heart's going quite slow, usually after a heavy meal mm. or in their sleep. The condition isn't always easy to diagnose and many people who've got this condition have a completely normal ECG so unless there is a high index of suspicion as in the case of your family um, it may be missed. So what we did in your case of course we did something called an Agmaline provocation test and that involved giving you a chemical called Agmaline that artificially blocks your sodium ion channels, these special holes that you've got. Now obviously if you've got a very large set of normal holes, then even if we give you the agmaline, the electricity wouldn't be affected. But if mm. you've got some defective holes and we block those up, then suddenly the ECG becomes abnormal. And it, it was on the basis of this that uh, we diagnosed Brugada syndrome in your case. Right. You may have read uh, on Google, for example, that Brugada syndrome can cause sudden death in young people. Yes. And clearly that's always a, a, a worrying situation for a young person. Yeah. But I want to just tell you about the sort of people that may be at risk of dying suddenly. So we worry a lot about people who are blacking out for no reason. Yeah, Craig fainted a month before um, and went to his local GP. Um, and um, they, um, he was having headaches as well at the time and he had had a virus. Mm -hmm. um, he was better, his headaches had gone before he'd obviously died, but he didn't die in his sleep. Um, he died all of a sudden, um, yeah, and shot up basically as, as he was dying. Um, but his heart went into arrhythmia, arrhythmia when the ambulance got there. I mean, are the headaches anything to do with it? It's, it's a difficult one. I, I can't be sure. And the virus beforehand? Certainly a virus could be. Uh, I wanted to tell you a little bit more about Brugada syndrome. As I said, people who are blacking out without warning uh, are m more likely to die suddenly from Brugada syndrome. And what you say is quite interesting in that uh, sudden death isn't off, uh, always the first presentation. Some people do get warning blackouts before actually dying suddenly. 
Some people may get rapid palpitation when the heart goes into a relatively dangerous rhythm that causes dizziness but won't necessarily kill them. So they're the two main groups of people that we worry about the most. Now the viral illness is quite important because there are certain situations that make someone with Brugada syndrome go from low risk to high risk and that situation is a high temperature. Right. So we often see deaths during febrile episodes when someone's ill from a viral condition or is immersed in a very hot bathtub for a long time or has been sitting in a sauna or has just finished running a marathon. All four conditions are associated with the core temperature, the body temperature, going up to more than 38 degrees C and that's a risk factor in its own right. So do you have to be careful when you're exercising then with Brugada syndrome? Well theoretically you have to be careful to some extent. I would say that all forms of recreational exercise are good for you because we know that exercise actually protects most people from getting blocked arteries when they get older and allows them to live longer. So I would say that gentle forms of exercise are fine. The only caution I have is very intensive exercise, uh, prolonged exercise such as marathon running, the Ironman, the triathlon, where the body temperature will go up. I would also say that intensive exercise for more than four hours a week is not necessarily a good idea because that type of exercise naturally slows the heart rate down. People with Brugada are often predisposed to sudden death when the hearts are very slow, so obviously people who exercise a lot have slow heart rates, so theoretically it's possible that very high level athletes may increase their risk of dying from Brugada, but death during exercise itself is uncommon unless someone's participating in a very ultra endurance event such as the marathon. In terms of yourself, how have you been since I saw you? Yeah, I've been well, thank you. Have you had any blackouts? No, I haven't. I've been fine. Or any situations where you suddenly become dizzy for no reason? No, since my tests I've been fine. So in your particular case, because you've got something uh, that's provocable, it's not there. We can't see your ECG to be abnormal automatically. It's, mm. it, we have to actually give you something chemically to make you, um, or shall I say, to expose your abnormal mm. ECG. And so you're, we would regard you as relatively low risk. Now, as you know, there are only two treatments for Brugada syndrome. There's either nothing and mm. just lifestyle modification or implantation of a cardioverter defibrillator. Uh, we generally give people who we believe are high risk an implantable cardioverter defibrillator and sometimes people who are extremely worried because of the uncertainty associated with this condition we may uh, have our arms twisted to put a defibrillator in but yeah. in general it's usually lifestyle modification and that involves several things most of which probably don't even apply to you we tell people to avoid amphetamine based drugs we tell them to avoid binge drinking and to avoid sleeping on a full stomach uh, two hours before they actually get pre prepared to That's fall asleep. Yeah. So those are the three main things. There are certain drugs that they should avoid, particularly what we call class 1A, 1C and class 3 antiarrhythmic drugs which only a cardiologist will prescribe right. or certain drugs that a psychiatrist will prescribe such as tricyclic antidepressants or neuroleptic agents for schizophrenia and manic depressive psychosis. We should also avoid situations that cause the body temperature to go up very, very high. I don't mean by going out in the sun, I mean sitting in saunas for prolonged periods, immersing yourself in a very hot bath, or avoid engaging in very high, intensive, uh, high intensity exercise for prolonged periods such yeah. as marathon running. On my ECG it showed up on the um, exercise ECG as well, so does that make you at like a higher risk? It is interesting because you're, you're quite a unique case in that when we normally do ECGs in Brugada patients, we either see nothing, that is a normal ECG, or we see a typical ECG of the Brugada phenotype, which is very characteristic. In your case, of course, we saw nothing on your normal ECG. Mm -hmm. We gave you the Ajmalin provocation test and we saw the Brugada. But what we normally do, we always exercise Brugada patients anyway. And what, what was interesting about your case was that as soon as you stopped exercising, your ECG went from normal to the Brugada pattern. So we were quite sure that someone like you would have a positive adrenaline provocation test, even if we did so. And it was because of this uncertainty I felt 
that I wasn't prepared to take any chances with you because your ECG was normal sometimes, becoming abnormal on its own accord, particularly after you'd finished a bout of exercise. Right. And it's for this reason I felt it was prudent for us to put a cardioverter defibrillator in your particular case. Right, okay. So you're, you're having your ICD checks at the moment, I understand. It, it, yes, um, I am. Your ICD is behaving itself. And it we've is. not had any discharges from your ICD, of course, because that would be uh, an idea for us that uh, your heart's uh, misbehaving. Yeah, no, it's all been fine, thankfully. Yeah. And then when will my children need to be checked? Good question. What uh, we're doing at the moment is, based on current scientific literature, there is very little data to suggest that young children are at particular risk from the Brigada syndrome. Ideally, what we'd like to do, of course, is find the gene test, get the, get the genetic mutation that caused your Brugada syndrome, mm -hmm. so that we could offer it to your children at a very early age, so that you know from a very early age whether any of them actually need investigation or not. As it happens, gene testing for Brugada syndrome at the moment has got a very poor diagnostic yield. We only get an answer in one in five families that we genetically test. And my understanding is that we don't have an answer in your particular family. No. So we would be using conventional methods. And I would say that your children should have an ECG at the age of five. And then we wouldn't do anything until they were at least 14 or 15. But I'm hopeful, of course, the speed at which molecular genetics is, is advancing uh, uh, and our knowledge of the genetics of Brugada syndrome is advancing, that by the time they're 14, we should have lots more answers than we do now and may be able to offer them genetic testing. In fact, every time there's an advance, we go back to our Brugada families and retest for certain other mutations that we weren't aware of beforehand. That's excellent. Because they couldn't find it in Craig's DNA. Um, they, they, they did the tests on that. They flew it over from Australia yes. um, to here, and they did, Harry did the tests on it, and they couldn't find it at the moment, but he said he would do further tests as, as we progress. The good news in Craig's case is that we do have his DNA mm. um, and we were lucky to have his DNA. In many situations of course the coroner doesn't always manage to speak to the family about retaining DNA and once, you haven't re once the body's been buried we don't have any genetic material from the deceased. But in Craig's case we've got DNA. DNA doesn't go off. It lasts for decades and centuries. So every time there's an advance in Brugada genetics what we would do is we'd test Craig's DNA first and if we find a mutation there, we would then come back and test other family members. Okay. But uh, it doesn't surprise me that his molecular autopsy was negative because the current diagnostic yield, as I said, is only 20%. The plan, of course, is for us to see you every year, so it's great to see you today. And what we're going to do today is repeat the ECG and um, put you on the treadmill briefly just to see how things are going. We don't actually have to do a 24-hour tape in your case because we can actually monitor your heart all the time through the defibrillator. The other important thing about coming here, of course, is to make sure that your defibrillator is checked. And the reason for this is twofold. One is because we can monitor your heart rate through the defibrillator, we can also check whether during the interim you've had any abnormal disturbances for very brief periods that you're completely unaware of. Yeah. And secondly, it's to make sure that the defibrillator is functioning properly. We know that uh, you will need a new battery in about 10 years time but sometimes the battery can expire much earlier so it allows us to keep an eye on the battery and the leads to make sure that the defibrillator will function properly should you ever need it. So without much ado let's go to the Cry Inherited Cardiac Diseases Centre to get your tests sorted out. Okay brilliant. ECG tests, uh, I was a bit apprehensive before doing them, but um, they're absolutely fine. Um, just a few stickers on you and they read your hearts, but it was fine. The exercise test is fine as well. Um, my exercise test showed that I, um, some readings of Brigada syndrome, but they were all fine. Well, I went, went for my pacing test, my first pacing test, um, and basically um, it's a bit like an ECG. They link you up, they check the machine um, it, and the readings. It's reading your heart all the time. They alter it if they need to as well. So on my first test, they had to alter it slightly because I was exercising lots, so they had to higher the rhythm. But um, otherwise, yeah, it's fine. 
they're, they're easy, they're very much like ECG tests, the pacing tests. That's your ICD. Oh, right. Okay. That's attached to the wire that goes into your heart. Yeah. Which always looks scarier than it is. So the wire is attached to that. And then that's fed down into your heart. And then the whole thing sort of settles in. So the leads come out of it this side. Yep, that's right. Because you can feel it slightly a bit just, more tender there. Just there. They down. get over and then down into the heart. Okay. But otherwise, like most of the time now, I don't even notice it, it's there. That's brilliant. It's brilliant. That really is terrific. The actual shock, if you did have one, is instantaneous. And it only lasts a sort of... Even less than a second, actually. Oh. It's literally milliseconds, which is thousands of a second. Yeah. But of course, it's quite powerful. So, yeah. with your condition, Brugada, it's a just in case you've got this, just in case you have a problem, and yeah. it's a precaution. And it may never go off, but it does happen. And we know that with Brugada syndrome, there is a risk of cardiac arrest and cardiac arrhythmia. Um, and therefore at least you've got that back up there. This is just a telemetry wand, as you know, which communicates with it. And I can go wireless in a minute, but we'll just pop that just there. Okay. How long did it take you to get used to it? About three months in before, before I started yeah. getting used to it. And then now it's just so much better. You don't even think about it when you go out. Mm. Okay, so these little signals are what the actual ICD is seeing every time your heart beats. It, and all it does is actually say, right, it's a normal rate. If it goes above a certain rate, then it says, uh-uh, that's abnormal. We need to think about doing something. Yeah. And as you know, it's set very, very high for you yeah. so that you can exercise perfectly normally. And this is what we always do for people with inherited cardiac conditions, Brugada and the others. Okay. So this graph shows that your heart rate at rest comes down to around 50, which is normal, yeah. absolutely normal during the night when you're asleep. And then, during a daily basis, it goes between 50 and up to about 100, sorry, 130, 140, which is when you're doing exercise. And this is my, what we call, arrhythmia logbook, so if there was anything in there, it will be recorded here. All ICDs now have telemonitoring, so that we can give them a monitor at home. It transmits automatically, and not just the same one as yours, we use four different types, and they all have telemonitors that can just plug into the phone line and sit there by the bedside or wherever you are in the house yeah. and it just transmits your signals either on a daily basis or wh whatever we set it up to send. Yeah, yeah. I think mine's um, on a daily basis. It does it on a daily and then it transmits formally. formally, updates every three months I think. And yeah. you've got a little blue button on yours I think, haven't you, which you can press if you feel that there's anything wrong. Yeah. And it will do one straight away. And it'll do one straight away. It yeah. doesn't wait for the sort of cycle. Yeah. Yeah. It's quite clever stuff. It is really, and that's mm. reassuring as well. Yeah. I know I laugh about it, so I'm a bit like a robot with my home hub. Yeah. <laughs> it's <laughs> lovely. But it is reassuring because then you know you're not damaging the leads or anything Absolutely. as well. Because all that would come up on it. So as long as the green light's on, you know you're okay. You know you're okay, <laughs> absolutely. Yeah, the only thing we can't test with that is a couple of the measurements where we have to do interactive measurement, um, which is using this special little programmer. Okay. Um, so that's why you still have to come back and have occasional checks with us. Okay. Um, one of these days it will be completely wireless, but we're not quite there yet. Yeah. The ICD can not just deliver shocks to the heart to put it back into normal but it can also if the heart goes too slowly it acts like an ordinary pacemaker right. um, and to find out if the pacemaker part's working we have to put a little electrical signal from there down to your heart to make sure it's actually making your heart beat okay. in reaction to the stimulus from the from the ICD or the pacemaker yeah. bit okay okay yeah um, so that's why we do what we call the pacing test yeah. um, and that just tells us again that it's it's working fine and that the lead is taking the signals down it's harmless okay it won't hurt um, and it doesn't do any damage to the heart it just puts the heart slightly out of rhythm for a second but not a fast rhythm it just puts it into a slightly slow uncomfortable rhythm right okay some people don't feel it at all <laughs> There we go. You see the difference? Yeah. This is the pacing spike here. This is capturing the heart, and there it misses. That means it's reached what we call the threshold, and it hasn't changed as well.
Okay. All right, so again, nothing's changed with the wires. If the ICD needed to deliver a shock to your heart because your heart had gone into an arrhythmia, it has to charge up and then deliver the shock. Right. And if you think about like a mobile phone battery, if you don't charge it, it gets flatter and flatter and flatter. So the ICD has a way of internally charging itself up and then discharging without delivering a shock to you, but to make sure that if it needed to, it could do it as quickly and efficiently as possible. So we have a, a sort of what's called an internal charge up. And it does that every now and then. And this one is what we call the capacitor reform. Uh, and it did it on the 7th of August. So if my heart did go out of rhythm, it would have to charge up first, is that right? That's right, yeah. This is called the VF setting, which is the dangerous one. And it waits for a second to confirm that your heart is genuinely in an arrhythmia. Right. Then at that point, it starts to charge. And it takes about eight to nine seconds to charge up delivers the shock. Okay. Now, if your heart goes back to normal during that nine seconds, it stops and it won't deliver a shock. Oh. So it's got a sort of check, yeah. internal check it does before it delivers the shock. Okay. So, clean bill of health. Excellent. It really couldn't be better. <laughs> After being diagnosed with Brigada syndrome, it's quite an emotional um, event in your life it means a lot to you and your family obviously um, and that's quite hard to deal with it's quite stressful but you overcome that when you explain the condition to your friends a lot of people don't know about genetic heart conditions so they kind of look at you a bit odd and then you show them your scar and they're all a bit squeamish and that is kind of a bit embarrassing I found that a bit hard to deal with but over time you make a few jokes about it you, you remember why you've got it as a precaution and um, and yeah, and you kind of carry on living your life as normal, so everything's fine after a while.